Okay, while well, your screen's coming up, I'll do a quick introduction. So Afranio Costa Filo is a Six Sigma Master Black Belt, and he's also a founder and software developer at Algo Basic Learning Games. And I think you just told me you're also working uh, in manufacturing doing Six Sigma on uh, a company that makes shoes in, in Brazil. So that's exciting after working for Ford for uh, many years. Many um, years. <laughs> <laughs> and he really enjoys uh, programming in Python and Arduino and Raspberry Pi. And today he's going to be talk about quantum computers in Python, which I'm really excited about. As I said, I don't know too much about this. So I think it'll be neat to see how uh, maybe what the future looks like. So take it away. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Um, hi, everybody connected. Well, first of all, um, it's a great pleasure to be here back in the Michigan Python. And uh, I'm talking from uh, Sobral city from the Northwest of Brazil. And today we're gonna talk about quantum computers in Python. Um, let's get start. Here uh, we can see my contact informations and the landing page QR code for the Algo Basic um, company. And let's go through agenda. Um, today we're going to talk about what is a quantum physics, what is a quantum computer, what can we do with uh, quantum computers, how fast there is a quantum computer, talk a little bit about quantum noise and error correction, um, show you some available quantum computers that we can um, uh, uh, connect uh, with the clouds. We work in an IBM quantum computer to run some Python applications and show you some re uh, create this material, okay? Okay, let's go. Um, the first question is, what is a quantum physics? Well, the quantum physics is, is a physics that deal with uh, small things like atoms, um, electrons, photons, and so on. This is a different from a classical physics that uh, describes the macroscope world, like a chairs in your directions, and even a, a, a flying uh, vehicle. And uh, we have um, uh, different laws <laughs> in the tiny world of quantum physics, okay? Um, and what is a quantum computer? Actually, what happened in the 80s, an American physicist named Dr. Feynman realized that that's not possible to simulate or even understand the quantum world with a classical computer. Then uh, he proposed a measurement tool made up by quantum elements. Then uh, we have a classical computers that are made by uh, semiconductors. And we have a bit that uh, uh, store the information. And this bit could be zero or one that we already know. And in a quantum computer, we have qubits. The qubits could be zero, one, or both in the same time. These qubits could be an electron or a positron or a photon, a quantum element. And this state of the uh, uh, have the two values at the same time, we call it superposition. Then in the quantum world, we have two phenomena, the super, superposition and entanglement. Let me try to explain um, a little bit about superposition and entanglement. Uh, let's imagine a coin. A coin has two sides, heads and tails. Imagine a coin that we have the both sides in the same time. Um, this is weird. 
And Einstein said that is a spooky uh, phenomenon. Um, this is a superposition. Uh, we can have two positions, two values in the same time in a qubit. The entanglement, uh, imagine that we have two coins. These two coins is distant one from another, a thousand, a million kilometer, kilometers, doesn't matter. And these two coins in a superposition. The time that I measure one of this coin and one coin assume a head size, for example, the another coin assume the same results, assume the same size. Could be a thousand of kilometers, uh, millions of kilometers. This is what happened with quantum elements. An electron that assume a value is in great entanglement with another one. When we measured this first electron, the another electron assumed the same characteristic. It's a <laughs> quantum word. Okay, let's move it. And then um, we can use a block sphere to represent the qubit states in a quantum computer. Then we have here uh, the, the, the block sphere and a vector that uh, represent the states of this qubit. And um, we have a basic quantum principle that is a Heisenberg uncertainty principle that said that we cannot determine determine the position and the momentum of a quantum particle at the same time. If we know the position, we don't know the momentum. If we know the momentum, we don't know the position. And uh, this principle um, uh, remains that the, the, the quantum world is a probabilistic world, not a deterministic world, like a microscopic world that we live. Let's move on. Then what we can do with a quantum computer? For example, we can develop more efficient batteries for electric cars. With the classical computers that we have today, even the supercomputers, we can't simulate internal reactions that happen inside a battery at the molecular level. Simply is not possible. We, li we, we uh, uh, live thousands of years to get all the simulations for the all reactions of the all elements, all the electrons inside of uh, a battery. Then the physics today, uh, we use simplifications and approximations in uh, lab experiments to develop better batteries. And with a quantum computer, we can simulate these reactions and get better materials, more efficient batteries, and so on. This is one of the applications that we can do with a quantum computer. Let's move on. How faster is a quantum computer? Because of the phenomenon of superposition and entanglement, a quantum computer does not have to wait for one process to end before it can begin another. It can do them all at the same time. Then uh, uh, we uh, uh, have results that uh, uh, we have 158 million times faster than the most sophisticated supercomputer that we have today. It could do in four minutes what it would take you uh, 10,000 years to accomplish in a traditional supercomputer because of the uh, uh, characteristics of a quantum element. Okay, let's move on. But we have some challenges. Um, it's not easy to build and operate a quantum computer. 
because these quantum states are very delicate, and even the quantum element could collapse it, could change the properties of this element, then we need to isolate the quantum system from the world. Then we need to operate near to zero Kelvin, for example, to avoid um, uh, heat effects. And we need a stable power source energy to avoid um, uh, electromagnetic waves that could affect the quantum um, system. Then uh, today, uh, one of the goals that the, 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 phys the physicists and the, the, the companies that develop quantum computers has is to develop algorithms and um, systems that handle the error that ha happened in the, in the real quantum uh, computers. And um, it's necessary to build reliable quantum computers that we can use uh, to solve problems in the uh, real world, okay? Let's move on. And what we have available today, uh, the quantum computers available uh, today, we have a lot of them. Um, I, I got some example to show you here. Um, the first one is a, a Google quantum computer. Then we can use a Python library called CQ. That's a, a Python development kit to run uh, quantum circuits uh, at, uh, a quantum at a Google quantum computer. Uh, quantum circuits, we talk a little bit uh, in the next slides, is uh, like an algorithm in the classical computer, okay? Here we have the, the link for the, the Google quantum projects. We have uh, Amazon project, uh, call it Amazon Bracket. That's a, 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 a quantum project from Amazon. We have an Intel, Intel projects. Okay, we have the link. I'll show you some ones here. Uh, we have a Microsoft project uh, and Microsoft developed a language called Keysharp to handle and to uh, program in quantum computers. It's a quantum development kit from Microsoft. It's like a C-sharp, but, but it's the key sharp. <laughs> and uh, here we have a Canadian startup uh, called Xenadu that are developing a photon quantum computer. Uh, and they use light, a photon is the light, to storage the information zero, zero or one, like uh, Qubit. Okay. And we have a IBM program for quantum computers that we can that we will use today to demonstrate how can we uh, program and use the IBM computer to uh, build and uh, get some results from a real quantum server uh, in the clouds. Uh, in 2016, IBM was the first company to make a quantum computing available in the cloud. In the last few years, uh, the new processor developed by IBM has 127 qubits that we can use um, to uh, run uh, quantum circuits, twice as much as the previous IBM device. This computer is named Eagle and have 127 qubits, okay? Um, uh, about Python, no, we, we use a library uh, named KISSKIT <laughs> that uh, we uh, can download in a KISSKIT uh, documentation page. It's an open source uh, quantum development kit. And with this kit, we can uh, communicate with the IBM server, quantum server, and run uh, quantum circuits. 
we have here the link for the documentation and we need to use well-known uh, libraries python numpy and netlib as well to plot and to get some results from uh, quantum computers okay okay and here you can see the uh, landing page for the ibm quantum and um, here we need to uh, create um, an ID and sign in in the IBM Quantum environment. Okay, let me open here that we can start to see what we have there. And here I'm already signing up. I'm already signing in. And uh, if you if you uh, use Trump 2024. Gosh, I have some interference. <laughs> um, here we, we have an API token that we can use to run locally the, the this kit. And here we have a launch lab that open our in the cloud environments that we can use uh, to uh, create our algorithms. Let click. Let me click in the launch lab. That we open the environment. I don't know why is a fly. I'm not. And here we have the initial uh, page of the environment. And then we can here, we can go here and open a Jupyter server. To run a disket package and create our quantum circuits. Okay. Okay. But before we start to creating a quantum circuit, I'd like to show you and explain you how can we create this. Um, algorithms in the quantum world using some gates then to to, to create uh, an algorithm uh, we need to uh, use some gates in the, in the circuits then we have here uh, the first gate is the poly x that it's a that it's a not gate um, a port, then this gate just to flip the values, uh, the qubits from zero to one and from one to zero, then rotate the vector or rotate the uh, spin orientation of the electron that represents the zero or one. Okay. The next gate is a controller not gate that we you use. The controller not gate flipped the second qubit value that we named the target qubit. If and only if the first qubit, the control qubit is one. Then we have two qubits. If you, the first qubit change the value to one, the controller not gate change the value of the second qubit to one as well. And uh, here we have a uh, you know, super gate uh, from uh, quantum circuits that's named Hadamard gate. The Hadamard gate uh, put the qubit in a superposition state and vice versa, okay? Then when a qubit in a superposition state and we measure this qubit, we have the 50% of probability to get zero, and we have 50% of probability to get one because when you interfere in the superposition state, the superposition collate, collapse, and uh, we can measure directly the, the state of the qubit. It's like the coin. If the coin is a uh, 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 toss, when we measure the coin, the coin needed to uh, get 
one side, our heads, our tail. You interfere with the superposition state when you measure, okay? Okay, let's go back to the IBM server. And let's get start to create our superposition, our quantum circuit. Let me get better here. Okay, then the first thing that we need to do is uh, instantiate an object that will be a quantum circuit. And we pass the parameters, the number of qubits and number of bits that we need with the circuits. I, you use two qubits and two classical bits. But why do we need a classical bit? Because we are using classical computers. Then classical computers don't handle the qubits. Then uh, we create the qubits and after the measurement of these qubits, we start these results in a classical bits that we can handle and see the results here in the Python environments, okay? Then I run the cell and now we can create our gates. Then I will create a polyx gate in this way. Okay. Then uh, uh, with this line, I change the value of the first qubit from zero to one. The qubit start, the start value of these two qubits is zero, zero. And here I will change qubit one, and we have one zero right now. Then I run this cell. Okay, I create the not gate, polyx gate. And now I will create a control not gate that I call CX. And I pass two parameters, the bit that is the controlled bit and the bit that will be a target bit. So the first qubit, sorry, the first qubit is a controlled qubit and the second qubit is a target qubit. Then uh, this gate will change the value of the Q1 uh, from zero to one if the QB zero is one, okay? Um, at this point, what we expect to measure, the qubit one is one and the qubit two should be one also, because we start zero, change the qubit one to one, and in a controller not gate, we change the value of the Q1 if the Q0 is one. The Q0 is one, then should be one, one, okay? Let me run this line. And now I will create a measure, circuit dot measure. Then I, I, I like to measure now the two qubits. Then I measure the qubit zero and qubit one. And I get this information and store in a classical bits zero and one. Okay, create the measure. Now we can see the circuits. We can visualize the circuit using the method 
call it draw. They use the matplotlib uh, library to create this visualization of the quantum circuit. Then we have qubit zero, the poly X uh, not gate. And here we have the qubit one and the controller not gate. And here we have the two measurements, the measurements of the qubit zero, qubit zero and the measurement of the qubit E1. Then your circuits are ready to run. Um, before uh, run in the back end, let me check the jobs queue it in the back ends to see what the back end I will use to run my um, circuit. Then I get the names of the backends and I will try the qubit counts from this resource and dot properties dot qubits. And I need to put an accept because we have some simulators backends that don't have qubits. And to avoid error, I put in qubit count. Oops. I put in the qubit. Let me correct here. In the qubit count just the string C later. Okay, and then I will print the message that start with a back end dot name. That the name of my back end has the back end dot status dot pending jobs kill it to see what is running right now and the number of qubits that I have free to work in the back end. Let's see if I get some mistake. Nope. Then we have here the list of names of the backends available. And I'm trying to find a backend that's not so busy. <laughs> Actually, we have a lot of uh, busy backends right now. Um, um, let me try here. Um, yeah, uh, I will show you how can we um, execute the job, but I, I, I go back to the, the material and show you the results because uh, all of them has a lot of jobs running right now. Um, Normally we have five, four, seven, the maximum, but now it's a lot of them. And we will um, um, you have some time. But I put here the job to work just to show you how can we do that. And we go back to the material that I show you the results. Dump from Kiskit dot tools dot monitor. I get the method job monitor to monitor my job in the backend. Here I can 
uh, choice my backend that I will use to run my circuit dot get back and of the backend. Um, let me choose the, 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 the list um, busy here. Okay. And I will create my job as a cute my circuit that I made. Circuit. My back end should be my back end that I chose. And we put to run this circuit. 500 times, then we execute 500 try for 500 times the circuits and get the uh, results of the measurements. Okay, then I put my job to monitor job and run this cell. Let's see what happened. Then we. The, the quantum server will validate and put in the queued list. We have nine jobs in the front. <laughs> Let's get running there and go back to the material that I show you the results. Um, and if the job is completed, we, we go back, okay? Then here in the material, you have this steps to create and to run the uh, circuit. And what we expect to get in the results. This one, it's a histogram that shows what the measurements that were, that we made in the quantum uh, system. What we expect, uh, we expect that the Two qubits get the one one value that I said in the, the beginning. But actually, because of the interference, because of the error in the quantum system, uh, actually, this first result got me the 79% of probability to found one one when I measured the two qubits. But I found uh, one zero, zero one, and zero zero as well. This will not happen in a perfect uh, quantum computer because we expect the other my results you get the one one. Uh, we can use uh, um, uh, you can run uh, several times the same circuits and the, in the same uh, server. And here I show two results uh, and two tries. The first try is the seventy nine percent. And in the second try in a row, I get 92% of probability to get one one. Then in the second try, the system uh, get less interference from the environment that come from the first try. Then the quantum word is a probabilistic word. It's not a deterministic word. Then we can handle this uh, probabilities and create algorithms, algorithms to correct and to uh, uh, get reliable results. Uh, in the list of the server, we can uh, choose a simulator that's uh, that's th that server uh, run a perfect quantum computer. And then we, when we choose the the, the perfect quantum computer, we get one hundred percent of probability to get one one as expected in the quantum circuit. Okay, let me check there. My job, oh, it's get a, a long time. Let's get back to the material. And here um, I use a Hadamard gate in a superposition gate. In the same way, I will create the circuit 
Now one qubit and one bit is enough. I create the Hadamard gate in this qubit and change the, the key, zero, key zero qubit to the superposition state. And here I measure the qubit zero. Uh, how can I say it? Uh, we have 50% of probability to get one and 50% probability to get zero if the qubit in a superposition state. Here we can see the circuit and here we can see the results. More one time, uh, the system uh, has affected by the electromagnetic waves, um, temperature, variation, and so on. And we have 50-50% of zeros and 44% of ones, okay? Okay, um, here we have some reference that I use to create this material. Then we have a quantum magazine, syntax uh, channel. Um, here we have a video from CNET that uh, shows the Google environment in the quantum computer lab. Uh, here we have two uh, papers that discuss about the quantum information, quantum noise and error correction. And here you have a link of the quantum mechanics from Wikipedia. And to finish, I just like to show you this quote from Henry Ford that said that any man can learn anything he will, but no man can teach except to those who want to learn. Then we have uh, live, we live a time of knowledge, and we have all resource available to learn what we want. Okay, then I'd like to thank you all for your time. And uh, uh, I'd like to special thank to Mauro Andrade, my old friend that incentive me to uh, learn about quantum computing, about quantum physics, and uh, uh, give me a challenge to uh, present in the college class here in Brazil about quantum computers. Thank you, thank you, Dan. Thanks. We had a couple questions in chat. Um, Motaba, hi Motaba, um, was asking how we find out the state of the system after each measurement. Yeah, by measurement, I mean read and write of data. Um, I'm sorry. Could you could you repeat? Um, um... Yeah. When when we do the measurements, like yes, the writing the data. Yeah. We're we're. Uh, like interfering with the state of the data. So how we do find out what is the state of data after that interaction? Yes, actually uh, it's a, a quantum phenomenon. You know? um, when we uh, read the state of the qubit, we we interfere with the system. Then for example, if the, the qubit is in a superposition, when you read this, this qubit, this qubit um, collapse and uh, get off of the, the, the superposition zero. Uh, actually, uh, the, the, this, the quantum computer system uh, use some um, strategies to um, get more reliable and uh, stabilize this uh, uh, interference. Um, this is a challenge today. Uh, Google and other um, companies are working to get some algorithms to correct this um, uh, this interference, the zeros, and get uh, reliable results. We have uh, a lot of av advancements happening. Uh, the Shenandoah. Uh, startup just to show a study that they use uh, a, a photon quantum computer to solve um, to run a simulation named Gaussian Boson sampling. That if you you use a classical computer, uh, the classical computer uh, will take nine thousand years to solve, and they. Uh, can do this job in 
36 microseconds with the quantum computer. But it's a challenge. It's a challenge that the physicists and the computations guys are working to get more reliable computers. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Bassam also had a question. Um, hi, Bassam. He asked, can you use this with machine learning models? Yeah, this is uh, the uh, quantum guy's dreams. <laughs> um, actually, we, we, we can just use today the quantum computer to solve uh, specific problems that we can create the quantum circuits. And uh, that is not available to um, you know, general purpose or general um, complex problems. Um, we, we get these results, the, the speed, the, uh, the, the condition of the quantum computers, but um, they solve specific problems right now. It's not a general like a classical computers today. But the advancement is exponential, like everything in our world. And maybe in the next couple of decades, we have a, a quantum mobile device or something that we don't know yet what will be <laughs> with a quantum technology. Thank you, Bassan. Um, Jean had a, a uh, question about <laughs> how long will it take to start selling a quantum personal computer? <laughs> um, I, I don't know, I don't know. Um, Actually, someone guys said that uh, quantum computer is a specific technology that uh, will not be available for the uh, customers, you know, but this is a kind of um, you no know, futuristic uh, prediction that uh, I'm not, uh, uh, I, I don't have courage to, to, to say everything <laughs> because we, we know a lot of things that were uh, uh, said in the past that it's uh, <laughs> completely wrong right now. Any other questions, anyone? Okay, thanks so much, Frenio. I, I learned a lot. I had never seen uh, <laughs> Uh, I guess loading quantum uh, <laughs> support libraries with Python. Um, so that was really interesting seeing what the capabilities are and um, logging into the IBM system. It looks like it's popular with, uh, with the queues to, to make the calculations. So thanks so much for um, giving the talk on this. I, yeah, it was really good. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dennis, for the invitation and uh, see you soon back here in the, <laughs> in the future. Yeah, I hope so. Thank you.